we're very uh, pleased today that Dr. Thomas Kidd um, from Baylor University, distinguished professor of history and the uh, well-known author, probably one of the best historians writing today in the United States. And many of you will re remember that he gave us a talk on his book on Benjamin Franklin and the faith of Benjamin Franklin several years ago. We were, that was before COVID and we were able to meet in person, but he has graciously agreed to visit with us. He's going to talk about, as we mentioned before, is his newest book out called America's Religious History. And I, when we when we invited him to talk, this was long before we were involved in all of the present difficulties that we now know we're involved in. Uh, so I suggested he talk about number or chapter three, religion and the American Revolution, because we always need to know more our history, if anything, this, this whole crisis that we're living through today, but they, they certainly act on those views, regardless of how accurate they are. And so the more we can inform ourselves, I think the better off we are. In his uh, chapter three, just to introduce him, he says that religion did not feuds over taxes and pollution. Religious concepts and biblical rhetoric framed the colonists' understanding of what was happening in the revolution. And certainly, we know that religious concepts continue to be part of our understanding of what is happening today and how we should react to it. And that's the purpose for us having this lecture. So, Dr. Kidd, I'm going to ask you to unmute your mic and turn it over to you and he will speak for, for as long as he chooses. I told him at the end, we will have to end by 1045 and hopefully about the last 10 minutes. No, if you're willing to take questions as you go, tell us how you want to proceed. Okay, well, thanks for having me. And I think I will uh, talk for a while and then hopefully we'll have time at the end for uh, some, some questions. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm, almost everybody has uh, muted their mic now, and it, it could help a little bit if you turned off of your video too. But um, you know, and, and when we get to Q and A time, uh, obviously you want to unmute when when you've got uh, questions. So uh, I've, I've gotten used to teaching on uh, on Zoom now. <laughs> so these are you know this is in case your dog comes in or something like that. Uh, that this is the the new reality that we we teachers are are uh, living with. Um, it's it's good to be back with you, and thank you to Dr. Brick for the uh, invitation. I wish I could be there in in person with you, but uh, I think this is the safer uh, route for sure. And uh, it also means that I don't have to wear a face mask when I'm talking to you. <laughs> so, uh, and and I'm always uh, pleased to uh, speak to. always pleased to to uh, speak to Methodists. Uh, I, I feel like you all are very ecumenical minded that you'll uh, welcome a Baptist uh, teacher to, <laughs> and to speak with you. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I, I do want to talk to you about uh, the role that religion played in the American uh, founding. And as Dr. Brick said, um, some of this I discuss in, in my new book, that's an overview of America's religious history, but uh, a lot of what I say in that uh, chapter derives from a book that I did in 2010 called God of Liberty, A Religious History of the American Revolution. And, um, and one of the, the uh, points that I made in uh, that chapter in, in God of Liberty is that as controversial as religion is today in American public life, and as controversial it was, as it was in 1776, uh, that there were still uh, religiously based principles that served uh, as uh, a point of unity for uh, the patriots, and I think in a way still can today. And so, so I want to walk through uh, 
uh, what those principles uh, were. Some of them certainly will be no surprise to you. Uh, but I, I want to start off uh, with an illustration of something that happened after the revolution uh, during Thomas Jefferson's um, presidency. Um, on New Year's Day in 1802, the Baptist evangelist John Leland uh, showed up at the White House with a prodigious gift for President Jefferson. It was a 1,235 pound block of cheese. Uh, <laughs> and they called it the mammoth cheese. And it was all over the newspapers and, and wild uh, coverage about, about the delivery of the mammoth cheese to the White House. And it came from John Leland's uh, farming community in Cheshire, Massachusetts. And uh, it, it, this, this community was largely dominated by Baptists. And it, the, the community of Cheshire seems to have voted unanimously for President Jefferson in the 1800 a presidential election and the cheese had a red crust around it and it was adorned with the motto a favorite motto of Thomas Jefferson's and Ben Franklin's and it said rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God and uh, two days after uh, the presentation of the mammoth cheese John Leland delivered an effusive sermon uh, before the president and a meeting of Congress and there was a Federalist congressman there um, in, in attendance who was hostile both to Jefferson and to Jefferson's uh, evangelical supporters. And this Federalist congressman wrote in his journal and he called John Leland a quote, cheesemonger and a quote, poor, ignorant, illiterate, clownish preacher. <laughs> he, he didn't think too much of him. And uh, John Leland uh, spoke on the text, I think from Matthew, uh, behold, a greater one than Solomon is here, uh, which was a not too subtle celebration of his beloved president, uh, President Jefferson. And the Federalist Congressman, again, writing in his diary, uh, groaned that, quote, such a farrago, bald with stunning voice, horrid tone, frightful grimaces, and extravagant gestures, was never heard by any decent auditory before. So he, he thought this was appalling. Um, and to say that, that Jefferson and John Leland made religious odd fellows uh, would be an understatement. Um, John Leland had devoted his life to saving souls and he estimated at the end of his career that he had preached about 8,000 sermons. And he said, quote, my only hope of acceptance with God is in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, you know, standard evangelical beliefs. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, on the other hand, did not believe that the blood of Jesus would save him or anyone else, although he did attend church regularly as president. Uh, he said that he always professed to be, quote, sincerely attached to the teachings of Jesus, uh, but he did not believe that Jesus ever claimed to be the Son of God. Uh, Jefferson similarly thought that the doctrine of the Trinity was uh, just simply nonsense, and he called it the doctrine of the Trinity, quote, the mere abracadabra of the priests of Jesus. Uh, so he was not keen on that doctrine at all. So what led Leland to admire Jefferson so much uh, that he would think to give him that big cheese? Well, the, the answer to that question goes a long way toward explaining how religion, both during the revolution and afterward, uh, provided essential moral and political principles to revolutionaries and helped to forge the new American nation. So although Jefferson and Leland could not have been more opposed in their personal religious views, they shared the same view that, this, uh, that the state should assure religious liberty uh, for all of its citizens. Now, not all conservative Christians liked Jefferson, to be sure. Um, many hated him because they saw him as an infidel and a heretic. Um, one even called him a howling atheist in the 1800 presidential election. Uh, but these critics didn't really represent America's emerging model of church-state relations. Uh, Jefferson and Leland did. Um, and America in 1776 was already a nation of many religious persuasions, not as many as today, but, but there was a lot of religious diversity in 1776. And just like today, 
differing personal beliefs divided people. Um, at the time of the founding of the United States, evangelicals and deists and a range of, of kinds of believers in between united, I think, around five religious principles of uh, religious freedom in American public life. Um, and th their alliance of the deists and the evangelicals and the people in between was fragile and it was hardly unanimous, uh, but it proved strong enough to allow Americans to quote, begin the world over again, as Tom Paine put it in his pamphlet, Common Sense. So what are these five principles? Uh, well, the first one we've already seen is religious liberty. Um, and during the revolution, um, evangelical Christians like John Leland all across America led opposition to state-supported religious establishments. And that's, that's a word that appears in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And in 1776, an establishment of religion meant a tax-supported uh, state denomination. Um, and most of the colonies uh, had establishments of religion going back to the early colonial period. But uh, evangelical Christians, especially Baptists, were the ones who were the most opposed to having state establishments of religion because the establishments tended to persecute them. Uh, and, and they didn't go to those churches and they didn't like having to pay tax money to support them. So from the Baptists of New England to Presbyterians in South Carolina, uh, dissenters against the state-supported churches sought to prevent governments from preferring or officially establishing any Christian denomination, and they wanted the government simply to stop taking any notice of religion in law. And they often gained critical assistance in their anti-establishment efforts from liberal Christians or from deists like Thomas Jefferson who shared their goals. Um, and really the main event of, of disestablishment in the states was in, in Jefferson's uh, Virginia. Um, in 1776, in, as they framed a new state constitution, um, they got an assurance of religious liberty in, in Virginia, but they didn't, they didn't quite get to disestablishing uh, what had up until that time been known as the Church of England. Um, what came to be known as the Episcopal Church, since Church of England didn't sound so great anymore in the independent United States. Um, and, and so in 1786, now Jefferson had already left for Paris, but James Madison helped to push through Jefferson's bill for establishing religious freedom, uh, which disestablished the Church of England, uh, the Episcopal Church, and said that we're not going to have any official state su tax-supported denomination anymore. But I think what is often forgotten about Jefferson and Madison's effort is it was supported by literally tens of thousands of evangelical Christians in Virginia. They, they, you know, Jefferson and Madison were politically powerful, of course, but they had to have the support of these evangelicals, many of them Baptists, but there were other denominations too, uh, who did not want the Church of England to be the established denomination. They didn't want any established denomination anymore. And so that was, was really the, the most dramatic transformation. And I think in all the states, for Virginia to go in, say, 10 years from having an official uh, Church of England establishment to having a very modern system of, of religious freedom, and that was a critical precedent, of course, to what the nation adopted in the First Amendment, where there's a guarantee of free exercise of religion, and also a promise that Congress would make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And in 1787, what that meant was, we're not gonna have an official national denomination. Uh, that's, what, that's what an establishment meant. So religious liberty is, is uh, uh, one of the, I, I would say one of the two most important of these, these principles, especially in terms of the legacy in America, um, and, and that's the first one that I want to point out. The second one, the second principle is equality by creation. Equality by creation. And you know where this comes from. This is the, the Declaration of Independence's principle that all men are created equal. Now, in, in older European traditions from which uh, America was, was birthed in many ways, 
Uh, kings and their defenders had often used Christian doctrine to affirm what they called the divine right of kings, the idea that God had established monarchy and that people were bound to obey what the monarch said. Uh, but in America, revolutionaries began to appropriate the idea that, uh, of common creation as the primary basis for the political liberties of all humanity, or maybe just white men at the beginning. That's the much debated issue, of course. Um, and the most famous articulation of this idea came in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, which proclaimed that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, uh, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which had been written just a, a month or two earlier, had been a little more generic about this, and it said that, that all men are by nature equal. But Jefferson and his committee in 1776 were, were intentional, in spite of Jefferson's own skepticism about Christianity, uh, they were intentional in showing the action of the creator in creating people uh, equal. So not people are by nature equal, but all men are created equal. And that was important to them to, the, to make that specific change. And this principle of rights and equality by creation was critical to the Patriots' efforts to, to say that they were equal to the people in, in Britain, that they had rights that no person could justly uh, deny, and that the British government was denying them their rights. Now, th there are obvious problems that are raised by this, and, and we discuss this a lot today, that, well, if all men are created equal, then what about women and what about uh, African Americans and Native Americans and so forth? And, and, and that's a, a, a dilemma that has continued through American history uh, right on through today. But I, I want you to know that African Americans in particular jumped on the, the principle of equality by creation within weeks of the, the publishing of the Declaration of Independence and saying that if all men are created equal, then no one should be enslaved. You know, we, we could get the idea that, you, you know, because of our modern sensibilities that we look back and say, well, why didn't they get it then? But there were people in, 70, in 1776, uh, by the late summer of 1776, who were saying, if all men are created equal, then there shouldn't be any slaves. So all, all that to say that those kind of concerns are not uh, somehow new to us. It's not a version of kind of revisionist history or something like that. that. That was a dilemma that came up right away. And it was because of the power of the idea of equality by creation. Okay, so uh, that, that's an, an important uh, caveat to know. All right, so religious liberty, equality by creation, and the third principle is that all people are susceptible to corruption and sin. Uh, and, and that was a widely held belief among the founders in, in 1776. All people are susceptible to corruption and to sin. Um, and and uh, basically, people in revolutionary America, including people like James Madison, uh, did not believe that you could trust in the innate goodness uh, of all people, and certainly not in the innate goodness of politicians. Um, and so because of that, they saw centralized government power like monarchy as dangerous because you don't want to give any person in the government or unit of government too much power. And that conviction led to the critique of monarchy in the British system. Uh, and it also undergirded their ideas about what kind of government would be best to replace the British government in America. Now, not all the founders shared the uh, Calvinist conviction that was, that was prevalent at the time, but not un universally shared, that people were uh, inherently depraved. The, the, you know, ca the Calvinist belief is that people are just totally corrupt and, and depraved and incapable of any good without God's help. Now, that, that was shared by some of the founders, but not probably most of the best known founders. Um, but most people in revolutionary America did believe that government should divide the powers uh, of, the, of the branches of government so that no one entity uh, possessed too much power. Again, older European political theory said that God had vested power in a, a king, 
Um, or maybe more recently in English history, there was an idea that parliament should be sovereign, the sovereign power of government. But the patriots rejected this notion, especially James Madison in the framing of the Constitution, uh, rejected this notion um, because uh, they, they said no one branch of government should be sovereign and, and hold ultimate authority because, as Madison put it in the Federalist Papers, men are not angels. And so you, you've got to account for human nature when you're framing the best kinds of government. And so th these doubts about human nature took uh, full force in the framing of the Constitution. Um, and Madison, uh, who is rightly called the father of the Constitution because he sets up the framework uh, that is uh, adopted in a modified form in Philadelphia in 1787, um, Madison had attended uh, Princeton, which at that time was Calvinist leaning. I know that that can be hard to ha imagine with what the Ivy League colleges are today, but but Princeton at the time was Presbyterian and and Calvinist leaning. And Madison knew well the doctrines of original sin and human depravity, and he he believed that humans did have a natural capacity for good, but he nevertheless came to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 with a plan of government that would account for human sin sinfulness while also creating a government that could act effectively against threats to the national interest. So what you wanna do, Madison said, is give them a government that's powerful enough to counteract the threats foreign do and domestic against the American people, but not give it so much power that it becomes tyrannical itself. And that, that again is one of the great tensions within American uh, constitutional theory. Okay, uh, fourth principle, uh, and it's sort of the, the flip side of the third principle of the susceptibility to corruption. Uh, the, the fourth principle is that virtue is the bulwark of a strong nation, especially a strong uh, republic. Now, uh, Americans were convinced that the problem with England in the 1770s was that its government had become corrupt and that, that the English people had become corrupt and so that tyranny had begun to set in uh, and, and that the assault on the colonists' liberties and the tax programs were just an outgrowth of that pervasive corruption that had happened in Britain. Now, whether that's true or not is, is debatable, but that's what Americans tended to think. Now, in a Republican system, small r Republic, small r Republican, we're not talking about you know, the modern Republican party here, uh, in a Republican system, if sovereignty was to be given over to the people, we the people in Madison's uh, phrase, then those people must be willing to act benevolently, always keeping in mind the public good. And when the founders, they talk constantly about virtue, okay? The founders were always talking about virtue. And when they talked about virtue, they weren't exactly talking about morality uh, in a personal sense, even though that was very important to them, but they were thinking about it in a public sense as far as uh, the people's responsibility to the public good and especially elected officials' uh, responsibility to the public good. Um, and if the people of the Republic would uh, not act that way, if they acted selfishly and just uh, you know, looking out for themselves and individualistically, then anarchy would ensue, the founders believed, and that would open the door for the rise of a strongman autocrat uh, who would deprive people of their liberty in exchange for security, okay? Th this is just classic sort of American Republican political theory. On the other hand, uh, many uh, believe, uh, agreed with uh, the Boston Patriot Samuel Adams when he declared that if America remained virtuous, then Americans could create what Adams called a, quote, Christian Sparta, a Christian Sparta, which to him was a unique combination of the Christian and classical Republican traditions. You hear that in the Sparta part of it, that it's one of the, the, the republics of classical antiquity where people were rigorously committed to the public good. Now, uh, today, when we talk about something like virtue or values, maybe is, is more 
uh, common today. That, that can be very controversial in American politics, and it immediately raises questions about, say, abortion or homosexuality and, and those kind of things that, that we fight about. But I actually think that in a nonpartisan way that, that Americans are still very deeply committed to the principle of public virtue. Um, and and I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately with COVID-19, that th this is a perfect instance of what the founders meant when they talked about the need for public virtue. Um, because uh, what we, we need so much, in, in my view, and I think the, the view of uh, public health experts, is for you know, rank and file Americans to just do what it takes uh, to keep people safe during this time. And it, and it would be so much better if it was uh, mostly coming from just volunt a voluntary basis of people practicing social distancing and we wearing their face mask and meeting on Zoom calls and those, those sorts of things. Um, and, and not having an attitude of just, well, I'm going to do whatever I want. Or, you know, uh, you know, young people saying, I'm going to the bar and I'm partying because I don't, I don't care and I probably won't get that sick. That, that's, you know, that's a kind of freedom, but it's not a freedom that's thinking about the public good. Um, and, and, and so uh, we would, I, I think almost all Americans would agree that especially if our leaders were rigorously committed to the public good, just that that's how they operated, uh, that we would, be, we would be much better off as a republic. Um, and that, that's not really a partisan issue. It's, it's just we, you know, we agree that it's better, it better if you could choose to have uh, leaders who really care about the public good than their own bank account or you know, po petty political projects. So, so this, is, this, as controversial as the issue of virtue sounds, uh, it's something that's very much with us uh, today, even in a kind of nonpartisan way, but we have a hard time seeing that because we fight understandably about the more hot button issues uh, that we don't agree about like abortion and homosexuality and so forth. So um, I, I, I'm always struck by, by how I think Americans still really like the idea of, of public virtue if we could just get the partisanship out of that. Okay, so virtue is the fourth point. The fifth point is providence, the providence of, of God. Um, uh, deists and evangelicals um, and, and everybody in between um, agreed that, uh, the, that God or maybe providence, um, as, as the deists would tend to put it, uh, moved in and through nations. Now, th this may be surprising because we tend to have uh, a definition of deist as somebody who doesn't believe that God is involved in human affairs. Um, and there were definitely deists who were like that, uh, but not very many in America uh, and not very many in Britain. Um, the, the deists uh, who, who saw God as the, you know, the cosmic watchmaker who wound up the world and then went off, those were, those were kind of the radical deists. But the more moderate deists, uh, people like Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin believed that God was still involved in human affairs, and they certainly weren't atheists. I mean, that, that they wouldn't have even known what to do with atheism, uh, but, but they were deists who still believed in providential working in history, including in the American uh, Revolution, and, and virtually all of the founders believed that God was raising up America for some special purpose. Um, Madison believed that, Jefferson believed that, and then you go down to the you know, more traditional Christian founders like Patrick Henry or Roger Sherman of Connecticut, they all believed that. Um, and they, t they talked about it open openly. And so starting with the war's opening shots at Lexington and Concord, um, Americans of all kinds of faith persuasions believed that the revolution had a providential significance uh, and maybe even prophetic significance. Um, and such assertions about America's role in uh, God's history in the world uh, reflected what I, I call a new civil spirituality that was emerging in America. Now, a lot of scholars call this civil religion, and I, 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 it's not an important distinction, but I, I prefer to call it civil spirituality because it's not like a separate religion that's you know, separate from their Christianity. Um, it, it, it's, it's folded into their Christianity uh, as a kind of patriotic emphasis within it. 
Um, and civil spirituality served as a transcendent framework in which to define and justify and fight this war and establish the new American nation. And it helped to unite the continuum of American believers around the proposition that the cause of America was becoming the cause uh, of God or providence or Christ or, or however uh, they tended to describe it. Um, and so Americans did define their civil spirituality in a lot of different ways. Um, and this led to a part of our enduring conflict over the place and role of, of God in, in America's identity and affairs. And uh, some founders uh, envisioned America, yes, as a specifically Christian nation. Uh, and, they, and they talked about that, uh, that way specifically, while others didn't really like the idea of, an, of a Christian nation. They thought that was, that was too uh, creedal and specific. So they embraced a more general American religiosity. Um, and even in the uh, early years of the Republic, these uh, differing specifics would threaten to divide Americans irreparably, um, uh, such as during the presidential election of 1800, which I've already referenced, between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Um, and during that election, many Federalists, the supporters of John Adams, questioned the propriety of electing Jefferson, who they called an infidel, and one, as I said, called him a howling atheist, uh, as president. And, they, and the argument was, we can't have somebody like this leading a Christian nation, right? And, and, but Jefferson's supporters, including many evangelical Christians, said, no, it's fine. Uh, you know, he's a Christian of some sort. Uh, but what's really important is that he believes in religious liberty. So don't worry so much about his personal beliefs about Jesus and the Trinity and that sort of thing. So uh, the, the debates over religion in American public life don't play out the exact same way in 1776 or in 1800 as they do today. But there, there is a continuity, a through line about how specifically Christian our nation uh, is and should be and what that means for American politics, okay? So that fifth point is uh, the providence of God working in American history. And the, these five principles, and there's more we could say about each one of them, were, were not mere slogans uh, like religion is sometimes today in American politics. Um, they vitally bound together Americans of, of widely differing religious opinions. And all you have to do is look at John Leland and Thomas Jefferson to see that. Uh, if it wasn't for their same view of religious liberty and church state issues, I think Leland and Jefferson would have despised each other. Um, and they certainly were not on the same page in terms of doctrine. Um, but their union and the joining of countless other Americans of contradictory private beliefs uh, forged an unusually free nation in which the exercise of religion could could flourish and, and grow and turn us into uh, a pervasively Christian country, uh, certainly by the, the eve of the American Civil War. Um, and common, common uh, public religious values also gave ballast to a new country that badly needed stability. We needed stability so much in the 1770s and 80s and 90s, and those religious values helped to, to bring that stability. And so in our own time, uh, more than two centuries after the revolution, and even in the midst of today's uh, intense conflicts over the definition of morality and values, I, I still think the propositions based on faith actually undergird many of America's greatest political tenets. And I, I would say that the top two on my list would be equality by creation and religious liberty. Um, and many Americans, you all know, see religion as something that only divides us and that perhaps should be excluded from public uh, conversation. And other people, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, call for a return to the sectarian Christian nation uh, that supposedly existed at the, the time of America's founding, uh, a time when they believe that most leaders, most American patriot leaders were devout evangelical Christians. Uh, but a closer examination, I think, shows that at the nation's founding, American religion was both diverse and thriving. It was diverse and thriving. Um, and, and in its most vulnerable moments, uh, 
of civil spirituality around these, these five principles united revolutionary America. And these values shared by the revolutionary era's evangelicals and liberal rationalists and deists established many of America's uh, most cherished freedoms. So despite all their potential for controversy, I would still recommend uh, those five religious principles as essential to the success of American civil society. So uh, I'm gonna stop there. I, I'm sure there's, there's a topic like this and given all that's going on these days, I'm sure there's uh, maybe a question or two that you have. So uh, Dr. Brick, uh, you wanna moderate the questions for us? Yes, I'll be happy to. I'm sure there are. Thank you, that was a wonderful, You're welcome. Uh, a wonderful trip back into the past with a lot of uh, thought about where we are today as well. And I'm sure there are questions. So if, if you want to, uh, I think there's a way you can raise your hand or you can turn your uh, video on again and turn on your uh, microphone. Okay, I said, not to my surprise, Bob Whitson has a question or a comment. And uh, so Bob, well, go ahead. Thank, turn to mute. thank, thank you, Blanche. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Kidd, how, do you, how does he think Thomas Jefferson resolved his internal conflict with thinking about slavery and what he tried to do with the early Declaration of Independence to address it, but at the same time, his own personal views did not allow Thomas Jefferson to, quote, free his own personal slaves. So how do you think he resolved that conflict, Dr. Kidd? Right, and, and uh, I know Dr. Brick has thoughts about this too, so she may want to weigh in, but, but uh, I'm actually writing a book on Jefferson right now, so th you, you just teed that up for me wonderfully, Bob. <laughs> so I, I don't think he did resolve it. I, I mean, I, I think that Jefferson uh, has a pretty sharp distinction between the conceptual um, and then the day-to-day. -day. And, and I mean, a lot of us are, are like that. I'm not, you know, I'm not one that wants to, you know, just dismiss the founders because they had inconsistencies about, about a number of things. Um, but Jefferson, you know, is, is very clear uh, er, from early on uh, that he thinks uh, slavery is immoral uh, and that he, um, he even, uh, in one of the most stunning statements he ever makes about God, he, he says, you know, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice will not rest forever. And he's talking about the issue of, of slavery. Uh, but as a young man, uh, he inherits many slaves uh, and is deeply dependent financially on, on slavery. Uh, and I'm per certainly persuaded, like most uh, scholars of the revolution, that he also had a long-term uh, relationship with his slave Sally Hemings and that they had children together. Um, and he did uh, ultimately free a few of, the, of his slaves. And we think uh, that, that several of those were his own uh, children. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it's a big complicated mess. Uh, and, and, but, but Jefferson you know, consistently said um, that he, he would want uh, the slaves to be emancipated if, if they could be, um, but that he always made it contingent on having them freed and then colonized somewhere else. Um, he, he said, you can't leave the freed slaves in the United States because it'll start a race war. Um, and he had a very grim, speaking of, you know, a dim view of human nature, he thought, if we have mass emancipation, it will, it will start a race war if we leave these people here. And so if we're going to have emancipation, we've got to get them out of the, of the country. Um, and so there were, you know, people tinkered around with these ideas about colonization, but it never really got anywhere. And so that allowed Jefferson to have a, a kind of out about why he was not pushing that much after the 1780s uh, for the state of Virginia or the nation uh, to, to have a, a, a gradual emancipation program is because he said, there's no feasible way to get these people out of the country. Um, on a personal level, I think a big part of the reason why he didn't free his slaves himself is because he was utterly dependent on them personally. Uh, 
um, financially. He was always in, in just crushing debt uh, personally. And so it, it would have been absolutely suicidal for him financially uh, to get rid of his slaves. He, he, he just never could have considered doing it. So he never resolved, you know, the sort of the ideal and then the reality of, of slavery. And um, he was not a perfect person for, for sure. I guess not. Okay. I, I do have thoughts on that too, Bob, and we can talk about them some later. But uh, Jefferson also, in his notes on the state of Virginia, uh, I mean, he, he definitely did not believe all men were equal. And he made that very clear. So he had a great respect for the Indian population and all and collected many artifacts from there. He definitely made it clear he didn't see them in a civilized fashion and the same. They fought on a different level of different groups of where they were on the civilization level. And so that's part of it, definitely. But Jefferson also believed in the natural aristocracy, so he didn't believe all whites were equal either, except as Dr. Kids pointed out, in, by birth and by equality, by being created, and by God, they had that equality. But there are many complicated levels of Jefferson's views on equality that come out. Is uh, somebody else uh, wanting now to ask a question? I have a two-part question. Okay. One, I mean, wasn't wasn't the country of Lib uh, Libya established by freed slaves? Yes, Dr. Kidd, you want to talk about it? Was, it was established but, actually by not the slaves, but for the freed slaves. Right, Liberia is what you're is what you're thinking of yes, what, yes. in West Africa, and that that was yes. an outgrowth of those kind of colonization. Uh, so th there were a number of freed slaves uh, who made their way back to West Africa for under a variety of circumstances. Okay. And, and Liberia was the main uh, political outgrowth of that, but they also went to places like Sierra Leone and so forth. Well, I think my question really is, what are your thoughts on uh, this matter of somebody not believing in God or certainly not believing in organized church. And how does this reflect on us movements to remove all evidence of God from our schools, from our money, from our pledge of allegiance? Any thoughts on those? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I mean, I think that, that one of the challenges that we have uh, is, is that there's a much more robust uh, public role for atheists uh, and agnostics in America today than there was in 1776. I mean, there's there's basically no atheists in America. I mean, they know they know that word in 1776, but they they as an intellectual issue. I mean, there, there's effectively no atheists in, in 1776 in America, and so they're not they're just not really having to contend with the idea that uh, you know atheists have claims on religious liberty too, um, w which they do. Uh, and, and so, uh, I, you know, I would just say to the, you know, to the rigid secularists um, in, in American society, I mean, they, they tout Jefferson uh, as, as a great hero. Um, but uh, look, you, you know, that, that weekend that he receives the mammoth cheese, by the way, that, that, that's the same weekend that he sends the wall of separation letter, uh, which many of you know, this is where he says, you know, what, the wall of separation between church and state. But he, he's sending that to a group of evangelical Baptists in Connecticut uh, who agree with them. Uh, and, and what they're talking about is that you shouldn't have a state-supported denomination, um, which I, I just couldn't agree with them more. I mean, I don't, I don't want the government running a denomination. I mean, you know, England still has that, and look what it's got them. I mean, less, less than 5% of people go to church there. Uh, and, and so, uh, it, you know, that, that's an important, for Christians, I think that's an, a really important legacy uh, of, of, of the founding. But separation of church and state, I think, has gotten a bad name uh, because it has more recently been interpreted as the erasure of religion from American public life. And so, you know, I, I sometimes consult with uh, public school teachers, uh, history teachers, and so forth, who say, Hey, I'm I'm just afraid I'm going to get sued if I talk about religion in American history, and that's outrageous. I mean, that that you know, not not least because religion is such an important 
factor in American history, even if you don't like it. Uh, it you know, it's an important factor in American history. So uh, I would say to the, the kind of re rigid secularists that they need to remember uh, that Jefferson himself, uh, you, you know, set an example by, now he wouldn't, he wouldn't declare days of prayer and fasting as president. Uh, so, so he drew the lines, you know, at some places like that. He had as, as Virginia governor, uh, but he, he wouldn't as president, but he routinely went to church. He even had, you know, services where, you know, John Leland, as we saw, uh, preached in, in uh, Congress's chambers uh, with the president in attendance respectfully, even though he didn't agree with John Leland's theology. Um, so, you, you know, if you look at Jefferson's example, um, you, you know, the same weekend he's talking about the wall of separation between church and state, he's attending a church service in Congress's chambers. So, uh, you, you know, the, the focus for them was we don't want the government playing favorites in religion. You know, that, that's, that's the principle. It's not, you know, preferential status for atheists or, you, you know, the erasure of, of religion. So I, I think because of the way that our debates have gotten set up, you know, and, then, and like on everything, it's so strident, it's so polarized and everything. We forget what the founding fathers kind of middle way was. And that that's, you know, that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, maybe, maybe I will just uh, point out there, there was one atheist I know of, and that was uh, Thomas Paine but he wasn't well received by many of the others, although he did some important writing for the revolution. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he was a radical. I mean, he was probably the best known radical skeptic, although I think that's developing uh, more in the 1780s and, and 90s. But even, the, uh, yeah. I mean, but even Paine in uh, the Age of Reason says, you know, here is my religion. I, you know, I believe in one God and my own mind is my own church. I mean, so, I, you know, I, I mean, even pain kind of seems to affirm this kind of super generic, uh, you know, monotheistic religion, but he just says, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe in Christianity, you know, that, that sort of thing. There were really amazing debates among these people and it's an amazing history that we have to look back on. And it's challenging to, to not see it as just one monolithic view. Does someone else have a question or a concern? Well, I, I, yeah. I, think one, I think one reason the, uh, we have these wonderful debates in that period is because we contrast it to today where we, uh, uh, people in government tend to have to have a, a background a cadre of speech writers who make these sound bites that they toss out instead of putting their own thoughts uh, to words and presenting them in a rational fashion. It's just, it really, uh, it's sad the way our political scene works today that we just don't have good speech writers today. If you hear a good speech, the person in government probably didn't write it. That, it, that, it, that excludes uh, our council in uh, College Station. <laughs> I think, though, that, that uh, also we hear more from everyone today. And then there was, certainly the common man had a lot to say, but you didn't hear it. I mean, a lot of the things that were written down were from people who were thinking at a different level. And uh, their debates showed that, I think. Uh, that we now look back on so much. Anyone else? I think, yes. Uh, as I say, I think the Federalist Papers probably are not as well read as they should be, but or or uh, acknowledged by the general public. From what I've been reading on various uh, issues, uh, we need to go back to those Federalist Papers and see what they were talking about. Well, I agree, and my students at Baylor read them, so <laughs> so, so they, they have to write a paper on the Federalist Papers, so uh, at least one class is doing it. Yeah, I might, uh, I might add that I read the Federalist Papers as an older adult, and I was really impressed. And, and I would also add they'd probably be censored today. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's true. And there's, there is a lot of religious content. I mean, you, you, it's so natural to them. Um, and th this is why even for secular people, I think it's important to understand the, the founder's mentality. Uh, so I always love quoting you know, Madison, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Um, and, and so that there, there's a world of understanding about human nature and good government, uh, just even within that one sentence. Hey. Doctor, this, is, this is Bruce. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, going back to, to your five tenets, uh, I think I think I agree with all of those. The one that is still kind of a mystery for me is the equality by creation, particularly with the racial struggles that we continue to have. And, you know, as a, as a country, we've had immigrants and, and groups of people from all over the world come in here, and there's been a fairly well, you know, sense of, of mixing those into, the, into, the, into the, the acceptance. But for some reason, the black group has stood out as being, so do you have any insights on why that maybe is is happening and continuing to be such a struggle? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, human nature, uh, <laughs> just, you know, fighting and, and discrimination uh, that comes natural to us, I think. But, but uh, you know, I, I, I think that the, the founders struggled with this, obviously, in, in even more extreme ways than, than we do. Um, I mean, we never turned the volume down on, on anything, but I mean, you know, they had really uh, serious dilemmas and, and problems, as we said at the beginning of the Q&A, um, you know, that they just didn't, didn't solve. And so, um, I, I mean, it seems to me, uh, and I say this as uh, I'm a native uh, South Carolinian, so, so you know, I, I grew up dealing with the, these issues, too, as a white person from, from South Carolina. Um, it, it, you know, how did emancipation ultimately come about? Well, you know, because of the, the Union Army, uh, and there really wasn't any kind of plan about doing it. You know, mo most of the northern states uh, did emancipation uh, via very gradual uh, p p plans. And so, you know, you have in places like Pennsylvania and New Jersey, they still have slaves there into the 1850s. Um, and, and so they're doing it over such a slow amount of time, and, and, it, and its so, social effects are, uh, you, you know, pretty slight. Uh, the economy doesn't depend on slavery there the way that it does in, in, in the South. And so uh, as, as wonderful as it was that the Civil War affected emancipation, there was no plan, and I don't. I don't even know what the plan would have looked like. I mean, that you know, I'm I'm skeptical about Jefferson's idea about, you know, there should have been colonization to follow emancipation. But at least Jefferson knew that you can't just have instant emancipation of four million people, and then no plan of what to do next, right? I mean, that it it's not going to go well, and and so uh, it, this you know, it's 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 not before emancipation that you have groups like the Ku Klux Klan, it's after emancipation, right? Because of all the instability and, you know, the social infrastructure is just ripped apart. And, and so I, I think in some ways we're still dealing with the fact that uh, emancipation, as, as thankful as I am for it, was affected by war, not by any kind of agreed upon plan. Um, and then uh, there, there was no follow-up. Uh, you know, and, and for a hundred years, uh, there was discriminatory law against, the, you know, the freed people and their descendants. Um, and, and so we never really have figured out, and I'm, I'm not that optimistic about the government figuring this out, but we, we never have really figured out what to do about the grotesque social and economic in, inequality that was left over after the Civil War. Um, and, and, and so, you, you know, African Americans, especially, are are left with you know, terrible economic disadvantages, educational, healthcare, every you know, just vast incarceration rates, everything, um, and and that's just a problem that we we never have been able to adequately address, uh, and and so we're we're left with those kind of debates and complaints about what we're supposed to do today, but we still I think focus way too much on the symbolism 
right? And so that's why, you know, we're tearing down monuments to the founding fathers. Whatever the merits of that, that's not going to do anything about inequality. I, I mean, it does, you know, it doesn't help somebody to get a better job. Um, and that, that, I think, is, you know, the, the kind of thing that really needs to happen. Okay, Bob, this, uh, this will have to be the last comment. Black, I, I wonder, uh, several of the, uh, in the Revolutionary War, apparently England promised freedom to the slaves if they would fight against the American colonists. And apparently several or several thousand maybe uh, joined the, the, if you will, the English cause of putting down the revolution in exchange for freedom. What happened to those particular slaves, do you think, that happened, you know, that fought on the side of England at that time? Right, you're right. There, uh, there was an offer in 1775 from uh, the royal governor of Virginia uh, that if the slaves would run away from their masters, uh, that, that they would ultimately, and fight against the patriots, that they would ultimately be granted their uh, freedom and thousands of slaves in the South took them up on on that offer, uh, and and Jefferson and Washington both lost slaves uh, who ran away um, in, in response to that offer. And you know that that shows up um, in the Declaration of Independence. In one of the complaints, uh, Jefferson says he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, um, and and scholars are unanimous because of preferences elsewhere that Jefferson is alluding to the offer to the slaves to, uh, to run away. Um, I'm afraid it didn't turn out so well for a lot of those slaves. Uh, many of them died um, as part of the fighting or there was rampant epidemic disease uh, during the revolution, especially smallpox, and a lot of the slaves died uh, due to that. But, uh, and then some of them were just betrayed by the British um, and later sold off to the Caribbean colonies. Uh, so th there's not a lot of happy uh, stories on kind of either side uh, of that account, but that is uh, it's one of the painful ironies is that the you know the people fighting for liberty uh, are also uh, in in some cases holding slaves and their slaves are running away and fighting on the British side. So you know you know uh, skeptics about the, the American cause have said you know who was fighting for liberty really in in 1776 if the slaves were running away from the patriots. Okay. I think we're just gonna... Hey, well, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, enlightening uh, discussion and lecture. We, we really appreciate your sharing your time and your knowledge with us. And we appreciate everybody else who joined our class today for the Academy. This was sponsored by the Academy uh, Lectures. And I'm sure there will be many thoughts that will carry on after this. And feel free to contact each other or carry on your thoughts if you wish, make comments on uh, any way you choose, but on email is easier. And we will look forward to seeing everyone again at the same time and same place next Sunday. Stay safe, be calm, carry on. Thank Bye. you, Dr. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.